Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Jimmy McGregor. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to provide communities in the Highlands and Islands with access to fast and reliable broadband. Cabinet Secretary Nicholas Sturgeon. Uh, with our partners, we're investing over £126 million in the Highlands and Islands Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, which will deliver fibre-based broadband to 84% of premises uh, in the region by 2017-18. Commercial deployment alone would only have reached 21%. Rollouts on target with over 14,000 premises now able to access fibre services in the Highland and Murray regions, and that will rise to over 45,000 across the Highlands and Islands by the end of this year. For the hardest to reach areas, Community Broadband Scotland is helping rural communities develop and deliver innovative broadband solutions. And last month, I announced a three year extension and additional funding for Community Broadband Scotland, taking its total funding to £7.5 million. Pounds. Jimmy McGregor. Uh, well, well, I thank her for that, but notwithstanding that reply, what comfort can the Minister offer to constituents in communities like White House in North Kintyre, where there are no immediate plans for an upgrade to the local BT exchange? And can she offer to constituents in those communities where conventional broadband is simply not available and who are having to pay up to £100 per month for satellite broadband, a cost that is prohibitive for constituents on a low income? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I uh, say to Jimmy McGregor that you know, part of my answer was intended to recognise that although the main broadband programme is going to deliver next generation broadband uh, to many, many, many more households than would have been the case under commercial uh, rollout, we recognise that given our geography, there are areas in Scotland that are hard to reach. That's why uh, we've done two things. There's a, a £2.5 million innovation fund which has been set up to assess technology options uh, once the fibre backbone has been deployed and as new, more innovative solutions become available. But secondly, and as I uh, outlined in my answer, we've established Community Broadband Scotland, which is working with uh, communities in the harder-to-reach areas to look at innovative ways of delivering broadband solutions. And we've just, as I said, increased the funding available to that. If there are particular areas uh, Jimmy McGregor wants to write to me about, I'm more than happy to ensure uh, that we look uh, and help him and his constituents look at the options that are available. Question two, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to privatise NHS services. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer has set out in Scotland's future. The Scottish Government's vision is for the NHS in Scotland to remain in publicly owned, publicly funded service provision, providing care free at the point of delivery. Unlike the Labour Party, we do not believe in privatisation. The no cabinet, se cabinet Secretary will be aware that the NHS in Scotland is fully devolved. And whether services in England are procured publicly or privately, Scotland still gets our full share as it is still public money. And we know that procurement in the private sector is usually more expensive. On top of that, the NHS in Scotland can only be privatised if this Parliament votes for it, something that we know no we party question, or no Finley. individual in this Parliament is advocating. Given these facts, facts on what credible basis can it be argued that Scotland's NHS will be privatised in the event that Scotland rejects separation. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I will deal with the facts. The fact is the UK Government has estimated the impact of privatisation will be to reduce the health budget in England by £1 billion a year within the next, within the next two or three years. If that happens, it means a knock-on impact, and the Barnet consequentials, which clearly Mr Finlay doesn't understand, will be a loss of £100 million a year to the National Health Service in Scotland. And un unlike Mr Finlay, I don't believe we should put the future of the NHS in Scotland in Tory hands in London. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, um, Presiding Officer. In relation to the Change Fund Cabinet Secretary, which is accessed by NHS and local authorities, and um, accesses home care provided by both local authorities and third sector providers, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware from his recent visit to Hare Myers Hospital about discharge delays because of home care packages not being put in place timelessly. Can I ask whether the Cabinet Secretary has had any further thoughts about a potential solution to this following his visit? I think, Ms Fabiani, it's really quite wide of the mark when we're talking about privatisation, but if the Happy. Cabinet Secretary wishes to briefly answer it. 
I will, as always, briefly answer it, Presiding Officer. I have this morning uh, announced £5 million to deal with the issue of delayed discharges, and I'm glad to say the allocation to deal with the issue in South Lanarkshire is £400,000, and that will be used to maximum effect to reduce delayed discharges, particularly in relation to Hare Myers Hospital. Question 3, Angus Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the newly appointed Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister Paul Peelhouse. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has written to Liz Truss, the new DEFRA Secretary of State, twice since her appointment. Uh, firstly, to congratulate her on her new post. And secondly, to finalise the details for notifying Scotland's voluntary uh, couple support schemes to the European Commission. In the first letter, he also took the opportunity to ask her to reconsider the appalling convergence allocation decision made by her predecessor, which will shortchange Scotland's uh, farmers to the tune of around €187 million Euros between 2015 and 2020. Bearing in mind that Ms Truss will be the fifth DEFRA Secretary of State that the Cabinet Secretary has worked with during his time in office, he suggested an early meeting to discuss the need for Scottish and devolved ministers' involvement in important rural and marine issues and I hope the new Secretary of State will look more favourably on and indeed show greater respect for the needs of Scotland's farmers, fishermen and other rural industries than her immediate predecessor. Angus Macdonald. I thank the Minister for his reply. I think it's fair to say that the previous Secretary of State, Owen Patterson, uh, is not exactly, uh, has not exactly left behind a legacy uh, to be proud of. Failure to repatriate the red meat levy owed to Scotland, failure to repatriate the convergence uplift funding for, from the EU to Scotland's farmers and crofters and failure to represent Scotland properly at EU level during CAP negotiations. Does the Minister agree with me that it is imperative for Scotland to have a seat at the top table in Europe prior to the next round of CAP negotiations starting in 2017? And the only way to ensure that is a yes vote on the 18th of September. Cap uh, Minister. Uh, yes, clearly I do agree with that assessment. I, what I would say about the, the need for us to be at the top table is we need to have direct representation in the European Union and the ability to negotiate our own priorities and avoid the situation, unfortunately, that uh, befell uh, Mr Patterson, that he forgot to raise the very red line issue that the Scottish Government had raised with him prior to entering those discussions. Uh, we need to achieve more CAP funding, clearly, from Europe. We need to have the opportunity to use the full fiscal powers of an independent country to encourage farm tenancies and new entrants to farming. And we need to ensure Scotland's agricultural levy supports Scottish produce. And finally, just to, to ensure we have overseas representation dedicated to promoting Scotland's food and drink sector and to avoid the ludicrous situation where we have uh, had a challenge getting beef imports to Japan, simply because the UK did not prioritise that in their negotiations with the Japanese government. Question four, Margaret McDougall. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of taxation in an independent Scotland. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presenting officer, in Scotland's future, we have set out our plans to build a simpler Scottish tax system after independence, which stimulates Scotland's economy, builds social cohesion and sustains our public services. The UK tax system is complex and inefficient. By designing a simpler tax system based on a clear set of principles with fewer reliefs and exemptions, Scotland could reduce opportunities for avoidance and so generate additional revenues without increasing tax rates. As Scotland's public finances are healthier than those of the UK as a whole, there will be no requirement to raise the general rate of taxation to fund existing levels of spending after independence. Margaret McDougall. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Just before recess, the First Minister claimed that in an independent Scotland, the council tax would be replaced with a local income tax. Spice calculated that such a move could cost the average family with two earners £550 more a year. Increasingly, it appears that under SNP proposals, in the event of a yes vote, big business will profit while the ordinary workers will suffer. Why is the white paper so light on taxation? And is it not the case that taxes will have to go up to achieve what is being promised with a yes vote? And if not, how exactly are you paying for it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, on Mrs McDougall's last point, uh, the answer is no, taxes will not have to go up to pay for independence. What independence will give us the opportunity to do is to change our spending priorities. And one of the spending priorities that we will change is the ludicrous amount of money that Mrs McDougall and her colleagues seem prepared after yesterday's vote to do, to spend vast amounts of money on weapons of mass destruction, rather than spending the money on tackling child poverty and the issues that I thought used to matter to the Labour Party in Scotland. Now, on the issue about local taxation, uh, the Scottish Government has a commitment during this Parliament uh, to work with others to discuss 
uh, the uh, future of local taxation and to uh, introduce a system based on the ability to pay. That is the Government's commitment and that is what we will fulfil uh, during this term of Parliament. Kenneth Gibson. The Finance Secretary will be aware that opposition parties have failed to agree proposals for devolving further tax powers in the event of a no vote, as evidenced by their vague declaration earlier this week and by Alistair Darling's complete inability to detail these on Tuesday night. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the only guaranteed way to Order. see this Parliament gain full taxation powers Order. is to vote yes in next month's referendum? Well, I, I, Cabinet Secretary, I, I hope you I have the question. I think, when, I think when people are entitled to know exactly what proposition will be put forward by the opposition parties and it was there was absolute no, absolutely no clarity on Tuesday at the declaration from all the party leaders nor has there been at any occasion in the past and there certainly wasn't any clarity from Alistair Darling in the television debate on Tuesday night so let's be absolutely clear if people want to control their tax in Scotland they've got to vote for independence Gavin Brown Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the latest Scottish Government mailing, it says we would increase tax allowances in line with the cost of living. Will that apply to every single tax allowance? And if so, what is the approximate cost? Uh, well, clearly, the, uh, yes, the uh, commitment extends towards uh, uh, the relevant taxes. And, of course, all of the issues would be set out in the budget of an independent Scotland on the issues taken forward by the Finance Minister at that time. That is what's set out in the Government's document. That is the commitment that we make to the people of Scotland. Question 5, Annabel Goldie. To um, ask the Scottish Government for what reason the decision to arm police officers on routine duties was regarded as an operational matter and not scrutinised by the Parliament. Cabinet Secretary Kenny McCaskill. Over 98% of police officers in Scotland are unarmed, and we've clearly stated on a number of occasions that decisions on the deployment of police officers, including the small number of armed police officers, are a matter for the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Scotland. This freedom from political interference reflects the position of all parts of the Chamber when we debated the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Bill in the Parliament. That legislation made sure that we also have the appropriate checks and balances in place, including scrutiny roles for the Scottish Police Authority, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner and Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary for Scotland. Furthermore, the Parliament's subcommittee on policing exists in order to scrutinise all aspects of policing in Scotland. Annabel Goldie. Presiding officer, this whole issue lays bare the Achilles heel of a single police force with no meaningful public accountability to local areas. A threat, a threat about which my party repeatedly warned the Cabinet Secretary. Does he now concede that this policy regrettably confirms that vital checks and balances have been lost by the rolling out of a uniform police culture across all of Scotland, regardless of need or appropriateness? Cabinet Secretary. No, I don't. I believe that there are now significantly more checks and balances and safeguards than existed under the former regime. Uh, we now have, in particular, a Scottish Police Authority uh, that I think has greater stature than the previous uh, individual constabulary's authorities. Uh, we have, as I say, an existence to that. We also have the parliamentary subcommittee that did not exist. We now also have three particular matters relating to armed policing. We have the PERC that did not exist before, and the uh, Investigator and Review Commissioner is there and wasn't previously with the same power and authority. HMICS have a particular role, an enhanced role, doubtless because of the single service. And equally, we have the commitment that Standing Fire Arms Authority is reviewed on a three-monthly basis. This is a far greater amount of safeguards and checks and balances that ever existed under the old regime. Question six, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps have been taken to tackle antisocial behaviour in Glasgow province. Minister Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government is committed to tackling antisocial behaviour. Our 2009 strategy promoting positive outcomes marked a significant shift in policy recognising that prevention, early intervention and diversion should be at the heart of approaches to tackle antisocial behaviour. The number of reported antisocial behaviour related crimes in Scotland has fallen by 38% uh, uh, over the period uh, 2009-10 to 2012-13 and of course there are also more police now in Scotland than there have ever been. Both Police Scotland and Community Safety Glasgow uh, confirm an overall reduction in antisocial behaviour in the Proven area. 
Diversionary activities are a key contributor to this, and local partners are working to ensure there are appropriate activities available for young people in the area. The Cash Back for Communities programme also provides a range of sporting, cultural and youth work opportunities for young people in Glasgow Proven. And the Scottish Government is also currently consulting on a number of potential legislative changes to the Antisocial Behaviour Etc. Scotland Act 2004, which will help improve the response to antisocial behaviour. Paul Martin. President officer, perhaps the reduction in the reporting of crime has come down for the very fact that members of the public have been charged for calling the 101 service. Uh, can the Minister advise me if there are any plans to ensure that that service is a free phone service to ensure that people are encouraged to support antisocial crime in the first place? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Minister. <laughs> Thank you for the promotion, Presiding Officer. Um, the uh, introduction of the uh, 101 service was uh, designed to ensure that the uh, 99 service worked as efficiently as it could in, uh, in, uh, in connection with, uh, uh, with serious uh, reports of crime. Uh, at the moment, uh, I'm not aware of any intention to change the proposals uh, in respect of the 101 service, but I'm sure uh, that the member uh, will want to make representations, uh, not just here in the chamber, but directly uh, to uh, uh, the Justice Ministers uh, in uh, that particular regard. Question 7, Christina McKelvey. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to address income poverty. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr. Officer, the Government takes low pay very seriously and we are leading the way by doing all we can to ensure as many people as possible benefit from the living wage. Our commitment to so support the Scottish living wage for the duration of this Parliament is a decisive long-term commitment to those on the lowest incomes. And we want to encourage others to follow the example we have set. That is why we have funded a pilot for the Poverty Alliance to deliver a living wage accreditation scheme which aims to increase the number of employers paying the living wage in all sectors in Scotland to make decent pay the norm in our country. In Scotland's future, we have set out information on our plan to set up a Fair Work Commission and guarantee that the minimum wage will rise at least in line with inflation. Over the last five years, this would have improved the annual earnings of some of the lowest paid Scots by over £600. Christina McKelvey. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for that very welcome um, a announcement? Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that over the last decade, more and more people are being pushed into poverty pay and reliance on and work benefits because of UK pay policy. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the only way to ensure Scotland workers are lifted out of poverty pay is a yes vote six weeks from today? Cabinet Secretary. When we look at the erosion of the, the value and the significance of the minimum wage because of the failure to increase the minimum wage with the cost of living, and every year since 2008 we can see the real effects, the, the realities of Westminster Government in Scotland. What independence provides us with the opportunity to do is to ensure that, in line with the commitments we have set out, to ensure that the minimum wage rises at the very least in line with inflation, which the government gives, a, com a commitment which the Government gives to the people of Scotland. Question 8, Rod Campbell. Ask the Scottish Government how it is improving access to justice for rape victims. Cabinet Secretary, Ken McCaskill. <laughs> rape and sexual assault are among the most distressing crimes in our society, and they are totally unacceptable. And the Scottish Government is working with our key partners to ensure perpetrators are held to account and victims have access to appropriate support. We have and continue to strengthen the law in relation to rape and sexual assault. That includes strengthening the law around sexual crime through the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009, giving victims of sexual offences automatic access to measures such as screens and video links when giving evidence, and Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Scotland's creation of the National Specialist Sexual Crimes Unit to prosecute serious sexual offences. Roderick Campbell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of a recent BBC survey regarding regional variation in the practice of marking police reports no crime, covering a four-year period, whereas Police Scotland has only been in existence since the 1st of April 2013. But how can consistency across Scotland be achieved without compromising operational independence? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm grateful for the question, and I think I should make clear that there are long-standing rules that the police follow in deciding whether to record a report as a no crime. These apply to all offences where a crime originally been recorded and include situations where credible information emerges after the recording of a crime which indicates a crime has not been committed. These rules predate the creation of Police Scotland and nothing has changed since the establishment of the single service. The single service so has allowed for greater consistency, improved national standards and procedures and indeed the establishment of a national unit as has been referred to. Uh, that ends general questions time.
We now move to First Minister's question. Question number one.